Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual, real, amazing relationships. The phone number here is 888-825-5225. Number one best-selling author, Ramsey personality, and host of The Ken Coleman Show is my co-host today, which means we've got the career expert, jobs expert in the house. We'll be talking about that with you as we go throughout the show today. Thanks for joining us again. 888-825-5225. Tony starts this hour in Detroit. Hey, Tony, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Better than I deserve, man. How can I help? Good deal. I, I have a quick question for you. We, I have a number of rentals. Um, one of the rentals has a mortgage on it, and me and my wife can't agree on if we should keep it or sell it. I, I would like to sell it. She would like to keep it. <laughs> okay. The other, the other rentals don't have a mortgage? Uh, correct. Okay. So this is the only debt you have? How about your personal residence? Personal residence uh, has a mortgage as well. Okay. You have any other debt? Um, yeah, I guess I do have a, a, a truck that has a, a loan on it. Mm-hmm. So, what are you? Why? No, why are you wanting to sell this property? Um, so, I'm in my my job, and I just don't want to focus on the ups and downs of rental. This one right now is an Airbnb, and um, yeah, I, I just am I'm over the. I'm overthinking about it. So the hassle. Correct. And she doesn't want to sell it. Why? She doesn't want to sell it because it, it, it does, it would make uh, a decent amount of money if we could pay it off quickly. It, it would, you know, bring in about $20,000. Well, that's assuming she so. continues to have free labor from you. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Yes. If we have to hire yeah, a management, yeah, if we have to be. hire a management firm to run this freaking nightmare called an Airbnb, then suddenly your margins are going to go to squat. Yeah, well, the margin the margin would still be about twenty thousand a year. We we can rent it for about three thousand a month, and then less insurance and uh, and taxes. I just said you had to hire somebody else to manage it. Yeah, yeah. If you keep it, you have to do that because you're done. Correct. Yeah. I How agree. much do you make on it if you sell it? Um, we would make about well, we'd profit about a hundred. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think the I think the core issue is is that you guys are not on the same page on where you want to end up. Mm-hmm. If you decide on where we want to end up, where do we want to be in five years? Mm-hmm. Do we want to be king and queen of the Airbnbs um, and uh, be in debt on my truck and uh, be in debt on our house? And uh, be spending too much time, bunch of time on this. Is this what we want our life to be five years from now? Um, if it is, then you probably should keep it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you have a different set of, uh, if you agree on a different set of targets that you're going after, mm-hmm. I want to be debt free, get my stupid truck paid off, I'm going to mm-hmm. pay off yeah. our house, and I'm going to get out of the Airbnb hassle business and have a calm, peaceful life again. Um, if that's your goal, then obviously you'd sell it. So, you know, if you were working the Ramsey plan, you'd sell it. But you're not working the Ramsey plan. You're just arguing with your wife about whether to sell a rental. You're just, you know, that's all that's going on. So, you know, you're just doing whatever the flip you want to do, and y'all are arguing about this one thing. So, But the, but the reason you're having this disagreement is you're not in agreement on your long-term goals. And when you get in an agreement on your strategic long-term goals, then the tactical miscellaneous steps to get there will fall right in line and you'll be in agreement on those. Yeah. And I think you make a very good point about the long-term goals. I'm not sure that they're both truly looking at long-term. They're not. They're looking at just this one thing. Yeah. She's like, well, they have other rentals and they're not thinking about, well, if we sell the house, we make a hundred, we pay off the truck. We've got these other properties that are cash flowing. They got to think 20, 30 years down the line. I think that's the great advice you're giving there. And then once we can get on the same page about our desired future, then it's a lot easier decision. There's nothing really to argue about. If we have a long-term vision that we agree on. Exactly. Exactly. Evan is with us in Denver, Colorado. Hi, Evan. How are you? Good, Dave. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Yeah, I see a lot of people are turning towards artificial intelligence and robo-advisors to get their financial advice. I was curious to see what you thought about that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I know from what I've played around with it, 
Uh, they don't necessarily say your advice is bad, but they don't disagree with it or agree with it. Um, I know particularly they say there is such thing as good debt and that uh, the best way to get out of debt is a debt avalanche. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you just got to decide who you want to be advising you, chatbot or human. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just uh, I see a lot of financial advisors putting it into their practices. I was just wondering... Is it a dangerous thing? Is it a good thing? Is yeah, it- it's it's both. Um, AI and robo investing is is good. It's there's nothing wrong with any of it, um, especially where you're dealing with a very small account and you're just getting started, and it causes you at a low cost to get started as an investor. But if I was managing a million dollars, am I letting a chatbot do that? Nope. Yeah. Don't think so. Yeah. Really? I mean, AI stuff's very impressive. Um, we were, I was looking at it in a meeting this morning, some of the stuff that we're going to be able to do with it. It's, uh, it's ridiculous yeah. uh, how, how cool some of this stuff is. But with it comes the danger of no human oversight. And, um, and, and that's the, the only way you know if the advice coming out of it is accurate is you're measuring it against a human's value system. That's the point. And, Evan, I would tell you that artificial intelligence is about knowledge. What it lacks is wisdom. And that's what Dave's talking about. You're talking about a guide, a human being who understands principles through experience. And AI is nothing more than a world-class aggregation tool, if you want to just break it down. And so it's knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. But the answer to your question lies in what you said, artificial intelligence. It's not wisdom. It's knowledge that has been aggregated, and you need wisdom. And it's never going to replace the human touch. So here's the thing. You are always in charge of your money, yep. not your financial advisor, whether it's AI, whether it's robo, whether it's an individual human being. You have to understand where the money's going. You are in charge of it. It's your fault if it screws up because you let it happen. It's your money. And so, you know, it, and so what that means is if your financial advisor says, oh, there's good debt, you need to go borrow on your house. You go, ha, huh, I need a new financial advisor. This one's an idiot. Oh, you know, you need to go get a. Universal life policy. Oh, I need a new financial advisor. This one's an idiot. And so, you know, you you have to make those calls because you've already decided certain things you're going to do and not going to do. And regardless of who it is that's coming at you, whether it's, which kind of, to me, it's very interesting. It's almost an oxymoron to say artificial (laughs) intelligence. It's like, you know, like airline service. You know, these things don't go in the same sentence. But anyway, the, uh, but, but it is very impressive. And it is a great aggregator, so it's going to be kind of fun to see what kind of what we can do with it as a tool. Uh, but is it? Am I going to turn my life over to a single human, a robo advisor, or an AI chatbot? Not a chance. I'm in charge of my life. It's my job to manage it. I can listen to what they have to say and decide if I want to fire them or not. This is the Ramsey Show. We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey.
Thank you for joining us, America. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author of the book Paycheck to Purpose, is my co-host today. Now, this is fun. We got big news. This is something we have never done in the history of Ramsey in 30 years. Well, with the exception of when I used to teach Financial Peace University with an overhead projector and a bad suit. But ever since the class has been <laughs> global and is being taught in tens of thousands of locations at any given time all over America, we've never done this. For the first time ever, our team of Ramsey personalities are each going to lead a Financial Peace University class online. It's true. Ken Coleman is going to be your coordinator. That's right. Jade Warshaw is going to be your coordinator of your class, and you're going to be in discussions with them. You're going to be held accountable by them in the group if you get in the group. Now, these groups are limited because the technology is limited on how many people we can put in there. So, again, Ken Coleman, Rachel Cruz. Can you imagine being in Dr. John Deloney's Financial Peace University class? It, I would put your seatbelt on. That that's, would, that's, that's going to be uh, – yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah, George Camel. Jade Warshaw. These are great. Oh yeah, and, and Eddie, Eddie Cohen, our event host, is going to he's going to he's going to lead a class. Oh yeah. Each of them are going to have their own class. That means you're going to go through if you sign up quick enough to get in their class. It means they're going to take Financial Peace University. You get to pick who you want to guide you through it. You got to go sign up starting right now. You got to buy, get in the class, and pick which one of these guys you want to do. This is a big deal. This is your chance to learn how to handle your money from an actual Ramsey personality being your coordinator. Now, they're going to be right there for you during the Zoom meetings. You can talk to them face-to-face. -face. Uh, these classes are starting very soon, and they're going to fill up in about two seconds. Uh, again, there's not a lot of spots because we can only put so many people in a class with the Zoom technology and all that stuff. So sign up right now by going to Financial Peace Univert Ramsey Solutions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, fpu.com. You go to fpu.com. Uh, of course, you can go to Ramsey Solutions and click on Financial Peace University and find it as well. But fpu.com, you can pick out which of these. So, Ken, how long has it been since you've led an FPU class? It has been about 13 years. Wow. Uh, Stacy and I uh, led three classes in Atlanta in our time there. And uh, I want to point out, if you sign up for my class, uh, I've got an evening slot, so you West Coasters and stuff. I'm going to be wearing, in honor of Dave Ramsey, my leader, my friend, a mentor, I'm going to be wearing a uh, leisure suit and uh, also have an uh, a pr overhead projector. We won't use it, but it'll be there I, as a I prop. never wore a leisure suit. I know, but I'm going to go a decade I earlier. Said, I said a bad suit. It was I didn't polyester. say a leisure suit. I know, but I'm going to go. It was not John Travolta. <laughs> It was of the polyester variety. No, it wasn't. wasn't it? It, was, it was just bad. It was just bad. It was just bad. I've always wanted to know what you mean by bad. It other was than just, just the it way was it just looked. Cheap. It was not. But it was not polyester right. leisure suit. But I'm going to wear a leisure suit just to make it fun. Yeah. So you know, I, 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 I think you're disincent. I think I people are have. not going to sign up. Now. Yeah, I'm joking. I have to look at Ken. There will be no Zoom props and suit. no leisure suit. Oh, wow. But it is an evening class. It is, right. and uh, Jade and I are both doing evening classes because we know we got people all different times a day. But here's what's cool: go right now and see where the personalities, uh, what the time slot is, because we're really making it available to everybody from every time and zone. A little bit of just behind the scenes stuff for you guys: they are a wee bit competitive oh, well. among themselves as to which one's going to have the most sign up the fast. Yeah fastest so if you want to support your favorite ramsey personality and you want to go through one of their classes you could jump in right now and give one of them a lead so this is this is going to be fun i think eddie's going to win he might but i can't compete with george and rachel i mean jade superstar financial you come to my class because you're going to get some common sense encouragement it's going to be fun <laughs> i just promise you that it's going to be fun Oh, uh, he's already. See, whining. I'm already it's working. Already, it. already no, working. No, see, it. I'm working it. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's is this a competition? It's just pitiful. It is a competition. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. hey, I'm going to get a participation trophy. Every, hey, watch out! <laughs> Everything's a competition with you people. <laughs> All right, Bridger is with us in Salt Lake City. Hey, Bridger, what's up? Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Better than I deserve. How can we help? So I am. A senior in high school, I'm just about to graduate, and I'm starting to think about college, you know, where I'm going to live, what car I'm going to buy, um, but I'm thinking about going into aviation, and I don't want to go in debt with flight school because it's super expensive. What is the best route you think I can go with that? Join the Air Force. 
through ROTC or the academy. Uh, join the Air Force and become a pilot. I was thinking about that because I'm kind of interested in, in you know, F-16s and being a fighter pilot. You fly one of those, they'll let you fly the commercial stuff later, I promise. Mm-hmm. Do you think, because I, I know, like, um, flying commercial, in order to make good money, you need to be with that company for a, a bazillion time. hours. Like and you have to pay for all those hours as a civilian. It's very expensive okay. to get into this world that you want to get into. Yeah. You're looking at right now, average cost about 96000 with no previous experience, 75000 when starting with a certificate. And so I think Dave's right. The easiest, most cost effective way if you've got the chops then you got to figure out if you got the chops i'd start talking to the air force you know you could also be a navy pilot so you got two options there and don't let them suck you into doing something at the air force that's not about being a pilot that's right. the reason you're going over there is to be a pilot that's so right. if they're not going to mm-hmm. do that then don't sign up with them mm-hmm. uh, I, i'm not i'm not you know i don't i don't want the recruiter to get to sidestep you here and, and give you the old uh ole you know, and so uh, I don't want to yep. do that. But I, I do want you to go over there and talk to him about what it's like to serve your country for four years and come out with the pilots with all the hours you need to go commercial. I mean, it's uh, that, that will be awesome for you and um, much better than spending a hundred bucks, a hundred thousand uh, dollars. And the, honestly, the uh, it's it's it is a very romantic field to mm. look at from the outside yes. looking in. Yes. And yet we work with a lot of commercial pilots and pilots with private planes as well, private jets and so forth. And um, it, it, you spend almost all your time not flying. It's true. <laughs> they tell you that. They go, the best part is takeoff and, and landing. landing. So, yeah. And it's just that you don't get to do, uh, you know, and, and it, it, do, it does not, it turns into, you know, you're a bus driver. Mm-hmm. That's right. You're driving buses. Yeah. They have wings. And an example here for this young man is is also look at things like a uh, helicopter pilot, you know, in the Coast Guard. Same deal, but then you move out. What about, you know, uh, f- flying helicopters in medical emergencies? If your desire is to be in the air and doing something that is active and exciting, to Dave's point, you got to look at all angles. And, and the advice, uh, again, for this young man and all young people thinking about something like this, hang out with some pilots. You know someone who knows a pilot, to your point, and have a conversation, get an idea of what's really involved. Yeah, and, and I'm not talking about a pilot that runs a, um, a, a, a yeah flight school. Flight, flight school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, yeah, that's not who we're talking that's to. That's correct. Okay? He's trying to make a sale. But I'm talking about a pilot who's done this for a long time, who's currently in the mess that is commercial airlines. Oh, my Lord, what a mess. Steve's with us in San Antonio. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. How's it going? better than I deserve. How can I help? <laughs> yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm 23, uh, turning 24 next month, God willing. And also, I'm one year post-graduation. I have 5K saved up. I earn a little less than 50K a year. And I have the opportunity to buy a house. Um, recently, my cousin is moving out of the city. And he approached me and he said, hey, um, 50, 155 at the high. And it would be around thirteen hundred dollars a month. So I'm just wondering to see. Did you tell me you had? Did you tell me you had debt? I do. I have twenty three k in student loans. No, you don't need to buy a house. You're broke. Broke broke people shouldn't buy houses. (laughs) It's not going to be good for you. It's not a blessing. Real estate is not a blessing. It is not a good idea to buy real estate when you're broke. That's why they call them brokers. You broker and broker and broker. You're going to be broker. No, you, you're 23. You make 50000 You need to clean up your debt mess. You need to pile up some cash after your debt mess is gone. And you get on a tight budget, pay cash for everything, and then talk about buying a home when you're 25 and you've gotten this mess cleaned up and you have a big old pile of cash. No, I, I wouldn't do that. I think it's a disaster looking for a place to happen, man. Please, please, Steve, please don't buy. I mean, buy Sean or you know, whatever it is, Steve. Please don't do it. No, no. And just because your cousin has a house for sale doesn't mean you need to buy a house. This is The Ramsey Show.
If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 45% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. Randy and Jennifer are with us. Hey, guys, how are you? Hi, Dave. Hey, how are you? Hi, Ken. Thank well, you for Ken. having us. Hey there. Love the T-shirt. I survived <laughs> Dave Ramsey, <laughs> Thank you. and Thank you. it's not in the budget. These are great T-shirts. Very well done. Very well done. Where do you guys live? Tampa, Florida. Cool. And how much debt have you paid off? $122,000. How long did this take? 26 months. Good for you. Wow. And your range of income during that two years? When we started, 130000 and we're now about 160000 Good for you. What do you guys do for a living? I'm a nurse manager. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in the same hospital, hospital distribution tech. Ah, very cool. All right. What kind of debt was the 122000 A little bit of everything. We were normal. Um, we had uh, about 60000 was of uh, student loans and parent loans. Um, about $10,000 was credit card, and the rest was two vehicles. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, you were normal. <laughs> yeah. How long have y'all been married? 14 years. Okay. Yeah, 14. And you look up at the 12-year mark or 11-year mark and say, this sucks. Yes. What happened? How did yes. you get connected to this Ramsey thing? Well, uh, when the pandemic started, uh, we obviously had to continue working. So it was driving to work. There was nobody on the roads. Feeling, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that part was good. No traffic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it was kind of lonely. And then uh, November 2020, I turned 50. So retirement was kind of really, really close, closer mm. than I ever felt. The old 50 wake up call. Yes. And um, so I started kind of doing everything, trying to save money, invest, pay off debt. Felt a little bit scattered. So one day my son said, Mom, you should listen to a podcast by Dave Ramsey. And I said, what's a podcast? <laughs> and wow. here's Dave Ramsey. So he had to download the podcast app on my phone. Yeah. And then he found your podcast. Ten minutes, I was hooked. Um, and ironically, one of the, the first month of listening, Ken and you had a show and there was a veteran who called in and you had made the statement that if you put a dialed in veteran on this, they'll just do it. Mm -hmm. And I myself am a veteran. And when I heard that, I said, game on. Mm. And it feels pretty full circle now that I come here to do my death free scream and Ken's here with you. I love That's it. Wild. So, so uh, Randy, uh, your wife is learning these newfangled things and <laughs> on, on, called podcasts and listening to a crazy man. And he, she comes home and says, uh, we're getting ready. To, what'd you say? Uh, she told me about this and I was like, well, first thing my thought was, Dave who? Yeah, for real. <laughs> but after she explained it and uh, all the details, I was like, well, I'm all in. Let's, let's go for it. Wow. Okay. And, and here we are. That doesn't sound like such a struggle that you need a T-shirt that yeah. says, I survived, Dave Ramsey. <laughs> yeah, I got to know more. Is that just a fun slogan, or was it really tough? <laughs> it, it was really tough. I mean, What was so tough? Just, the, I mean, in order to do this program, you have to have communication. I mean, yeah. it, it's so easy to just to, like you said, spend and forget about it and spend and forget about it. And 
before you know it, you're you're knee deep and you know what. So yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and you've just been kind of shuffling along, and everything just keeps getting bigger. The debt does. Exactly. It doesn't go away. You just add to it a little bit every year, and then you look up and go, God, we got one hundred twenty-two thousand dollars there. Not even counting the house. <laughs> yeah. Wow. How intense was it? I mean, when you went all in, I, and by the way, what, tell us our audience, what service, what branch of service you served in? Air Force. Air Force. Thank you very much for thank that. Thank you. Uh, so what was so intense? I mean, what did you guys do right out of the gate? Because this is a lot of debt in a little bit of time. We followed everything to the T. I mean, no eating out, never stepped foot in a restaurant, coffee shop, nothing. We literally got up, went to work, came home. That is it. Mm. Um, everything was budgeted down to the dollar. We love your every dollar app. Um, never used the budget in my entire life. That app is amazing. I actually have a panic attack now if it gets too close to the start of the next month that I don't have my budget made. Wow, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so lots of discipline. And also lots of uh, uh, monthly budget meetings, too. That helped dial it in. She really helped a lot with that because we're like, oh, this is how much we need. This is how much we're, we're... – so that helped uh, tremendously. So how much extra did you work? Um, well, I'm salary, so I couldn't do a ton. But I, there was a period of time I did do some door dashing. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's the 50-year-old woman door dashing food to 20-year-olds. Um, <laughs> While listening to a podcast. <laughs> While listening to Dave Ramsey. <laughs> Uh, and then um, Randy had a pretty labor-intensive job for a period of time that really uh, brought some income in. So it yeah. was tough. He wow. was on afternoons. I was on days. Okay. Wow. Well, good job, you guys. Good job. What do you tell people the key now to getting out of debt is? Well, just communication, like I said, you yeah. you have to be to you you have to be on the same page. You just can't have one person dragging the other person through this process. It's mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah. So you guys really, uh, I mean, you were very unified. 100%. Oh, yes. In this approach. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to do if you're not, especially the amount of money you paid off in this. Did you sell anything big? Nothing big. We mm. didn't really have much. You, paid off, you just paid off the cars and kept them. Paid. Yeah. The, we yes. still stayed in the principles yeah. that you recommend, so we mm -hmm. figured we're just going to pay them off and now keep them yeah. forever. Good. Good. Very good. Way to go. How's it feel to be free? <laughs> it's amazing good. and good. we were very ha it's very humbling to come up here to kind of put your stupidity out here but the debt free screams definitely were a motivator for us and kept us going especially in like midway and you see these mountains of debt and just hearing other people's stories really helped us like don't give up don't quit it's motivation mm -hmm. so it's once you're to the end i mean it is so worth it and now we just did a quick trip here to meet you and uh come to ramsey solutions and now we get to watch all of our money pile up in the savings <laughs> <laughs> what a different emotion that is very that you had when you turned 50 and started looking at the end of life now it's a whole different view yes yes it is it is very cool very cool well congratulations we're very proud of y'all thank you very really. much extremely well done excellent excellent story too and uh no you didn't do anything that sh you should be embarrassed about standing on this stage you should you did a lot of things you should be proud about mm -hmm. and so uh and most everybody in america has a bunch of stupid debt and you guys decide to do something about it which is pretty impressive Pretty impressive. We've got the uh, Live and Give box for you. That includes the Baby Steps Millionaires book on the latest number one bestseller on how to be a millionaire. And that's where you're going next, for sure. The Total Money Makeover book that 10 million people now have used. And you've used the principles from it, for sure. And uh, Financial Peace University membership, all of that. You can either use it or give it away. It's uh, the, the Live and Give box. It's all for you guys. And we sell those, of course, in the bookstore as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for being up here. And uh, you brought uh, one of your children with you? Yes. My daughter Madison's here with her boyfriend, uh, Eli. All right. That Very good. Son Anthony's at home. Okay. Dog sitting. <laughs> well, somebody's got to do it. Way to go, Anthony. All right. Good stuff. All all right, Randy and Jennifer Tampa, Florida, $122,000 paid off in 26 months, making 130 to 160. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, Three two, two, one. one. We're, We're debt, debt free. free. Yeah. 
That's how that's done. Woo! It is interesting how many times something happens in someone's life and it they have a baby, they get married, they turn 50, mm. they lose a job, they get a new job, uh, and that is the, the there's this change mm -hmm. that gives them the wake up call. That's exactly right. Yeah, and they decide, you know what, life where it is now is not what we want it to be, and we're going to finally take the steps to live the life we want. And there's no regret with people that pay off all their debt and live with true freedom, financial yeah. peace. I've never had somebody do a debt-free scream and goes, you know, I'm so sad, so bad. At, I'm just sad yeah. that I did this. That's right. I'm going to go right back in debt. I never hear that. This is The Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us, America. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us. Sean is with us in Orlando. Hey, Sean, how are you? Hey, I'm doing just fine. Thanks, Dave and Ken, for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Well, my wife and I are in uh, Baby Step 7, and we're doing a monthly dollar cost average into an S&P index. Our time frame is five years, and my question is, do we continue the dollar cost average for five years all the way through, or do we taper back into savings at a certain point? Why would you taper back into savings? Well, I guess I'm overthinking it, because I know that if the time frame is shorter than five years, you want to save and not Oh, invest. I see and what so, you're saying. I see. So what are you buying with us in the five years? Uh, a, a new home. We're okay. looking to upgrade our home. That's fun. Okay. Um, yeah. No, uh, if you started if you started tapering back to savings, that would be you're presupposing you're trying to time the market, and I wouldn't. I would just play it all okay. the way through. And un unless you see some kind of serious dark cloud on the horizon that scares you, and then I would just move it all to cash at the end of the five-year period. Okay, because okay, you, yeah, you know sure. how much money are you going to have in there after five years? Eh, probably about a hundred, hundred twenty-five. Okay, and so if it loses ten percent, is twelve thousand dollars. It does not keep you from doing the deal. Sure. Okay, and that's that'd be the most you would ever see. I mean, very, very few times in history do you see uh, the market lose more than ten percent in a twelve-month period of time. Very, very few times. And so that's a that's an amount of money you can absorb, and it doesn't keep you from doing the deal. So I'm going to ride it all the way in, and unless I see some big, huge, not just news, not just stuff on the news, but I'm just really, really, really uh, concerned about. Uh, the presidential administration or something like that that's going to screw this thing up. I, I'm going to probably just sit there until I buy and just take it out of the S&P 500 and buy. As a matter of fact, the truth is that's what I do. I don't worry that much about dollar cost averaging, but I use an S&P 500. I throw excess cash in an S&P 500 uh, way in, over and above all my other investing. Okay, this is just excess cash until it gets enough in there to buy a piece of real estate. And whether that's a year, two years, five years, seven years, whatever it is, I just keep throwing it in there. And then when I'm ready, I just take enough out of that S&P and buy that piece of real estate. Then, And in a sense, that's what you're doing. And I do that all the time for investment real estate. Um, and so right now, I've got a pretty good stash sitting in S&P, and the market's down. And so I, I'm, I'm going to do really good when the market rebounds. So it's going to be an excellent time to next, you know, next 12 months or so to pull that out and buy some real estate, except that the real estate will probably have gone up, but um, depending on what I'm buying. But anyway, all that. So to say, yeah, I'm just going to ride it straight through. I'm not going to try to back off and 
you know, play the game against the odds of and being cash, uh, you'll lose more than you'll make 90 p- times out of 100 screwing around with that. So good question, though. Thanks for calling in. Open phones at 888 825 Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Ethan is in Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, Ethan. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. Mm. How can I help? Yes, sir. Well, me and my wife are thinking about considering a debt consolidation loan. We don't have any type of credit card debt. Um, that's just something early on we decided we didn't want to get into. Um but really, all we have, I guess, as far as debt, are a couple vehicle loans. Um, and I, the, the other big part of debt that we have is whenever we had got our house, they had under-budgeted us on our well. And so we had to borrow about $10,000 from a family member. And we have also purchased a storage building from that family member as well. So we actually owe them right at thirteen five mm-hmm. for everything. So we're trying to figure out if it's best to do a debt consolidation loan for all of that, or if it would be better just to make payments to them as we can afford it. The only thing with family is I've seen a lot of times where you owe family money and it causes issues. Yeah, you should have thought of that before you bought a stupid barn from them. (laughs) That's that's my biggest thing is just trying to figure out if we should do a debt consolidation loan or if that's even a good idea. What does a debt consolidation loan do? It just puts it in one pile instead of four piles. Pretty much, yeah. Doesn't change anything. Well, I know sometimes, because we had figured it up, it was going to save about $400 a month. Um, No, it's not. Not unless you stay in debt longer. Okay. That might be. You didn't change your interest rate by $5,000 a year on the figures you gave me. You'd have to change your interest rate by 10%. What kind of car loans have you got? A 19% car loan? No, sir. No, I've got a 12% car loan, and they were going to match that at the debt consolidation loan. Yeah, which means you got absolutely gained no ground. So where the $400 savings come from? Only one way mathematically it could happen, and that's extend the length of the loan. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you want to be in debt longer? Well, just because it was going to save us a little bit of money, I guess. No, it didn't. It saved you money per month. It didn't save you money. You're going to be in debt longer, and it's going to cost you more money because you're going to pay interest longer. No, that completely makes sense. Yeah. So what's your household income? Uh, Well, I'm self-employed. My wife is a stay-at-home mother. What Uh, do you make? Profit was... Profit was 70000 last year. Okay. You guys roll up your sleeves, don't go to restaurants, and don't go on vacation until you get this crap cleaned up. What do you owe yes, on these sir. cars? Well, I've got I've got a truck payment, and it's 16000 We've uh-huh. got a Honda CRV payment. It's 5500 is what we owe left on it. Then we've got a personal loan to borrow um, for a vehicle we got. When we got the vehicle, the transmission went out. So we had to also borrow for that, and the total of that personal loan is 6500 Yeah. Okay. You're driving an awfully nice truck for this mess. Um, so yeah, you got, you know, you got what, $45,000, including all the family junk and you make right. 70. And so it's going to take you two years of living on beans and rice, rice and beans, and you'll be done. Right. List these debts, smallest to largest, pay minimum payments on everything, but the little one and attack the little one, like your freaking life depends on it. Okay. And go get your life back and quit borrowing money for this stupid stuff. Yes, sir. It did not bring you joy. Right. Yeah. So next time you need a truck, don't buy one unless you have the money. Be like your grandpa. Don't buy it unless you can afford it. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see them, beyond what you said, I'd like to see them jumpstart this. And if it's me, I'm I'm looking. If I've got some equity in that truck, I'm selling it. Uh, I'm working extra hours. We are in the best part-time economy as it relates to jobs that we've ever seen, Dave, in the history of America. He can go make some money. I'd jumpstart this. And you know, let me ask you this, Ken, because you talk about the jobs part all the time. And from the very first day we started teaching Financial Peace University 30 years ago, we've told people to get an extra job. That's right. And it used to be we'd tell them to deliver pizza. Yeah. Now everybody seems to be delivering food. Yeah. Uber Eats. Right. Um, and, and I'm not against Uber Eats or DoorDashing or any of that. That's all fine. It's an easy thing to plug in and plug out. Right. You, you can log in, log out, just keep rocking. You can manage your own hours. I'm not convinced it is the most profitable part-time job. It's not. And What it's, are they? Yeah, so they are, you're looking for manual labor positions. And what I mean by manual labor doesn't mean shoveling or using a hammer. But if they just need a body 
to stock shelves and warehousing. Manufacturing right now is really, really strong. And they're paying more they're than you paying, can make doing Uber Eats. Yes, much more. Because if you go work for Walmart or a Target or a big box store and you're working off hours, so he's got a full-time job, he's running his own business. How can I pick up 20 hours a week? It's just rule of thumb. What do they pay in a place like 16, that? 16 18 to $20 an hour. Depending on where you are. Depending on where you are. So yeah. you got to look. The point is, don't just assume I'm going to go well, drive. Here's the thing. I was talking to, when we were in Salt Lake City the other day, I was talking to a group and uh, just standing around at one of our events. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them was telling me that stinking babysitter yes. is getting 30 bucks an hour. That's true. Let me tell you, 40 bucks really an crazy hour is, for, for yeah. babies, dog walking. Yes. For the lady was on here yesterday, did her debt free scream. Yes. 30 minutes for yes. $30. Yes. Rich people don't even walk their own dogs. That's exactly right. What yeah. is this? That's right. I know they're scared of leaves. That's right. That's they right. Get, you get you a leaf blower, you can make yeah. money because rich people are scared of leaves, but I didn't know they don't even walk their own dog. That's right. But just look in your local economy. Who's having a hard time hiring people? See what they're paying. This isn't about skill, this is about gazelle. And so go fill a gap and make some really good money. Yeah, kick your money up, drop your expenses down, clean your mess up. You can't borrow your way out of debt. That's the moral of the story of this call. Debt con solidation doesn't work because you haven't fixed the problem in your mirror. Hey, it's Ken. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author of the book Paycheck to Purpose, is my co-host today. We invite your calls about your life, your money, your career, your jobs, your relationships, whatever it is. We'll talk to you about it right here as we do every day. 888 Alex is in Seattle. Hey, Alex, what's up? Hey, Dave and Ken. So I made a kind of a silly mistake when I was a little younger. Back in You're the only one. I know, right? <laughs> Everyone else has it right. <laughs> Uh, Nobody so makes mistakes, silly mistakes when they're young. That never happens. Hey, so what'd you do, man? Yeah. So I bought a house. Um, I bought a house with a mortgage. Um, got really low interest rate. However, instead of refinancing a few years later, I went to my folks um, and asked if they would pay it off, and I could just pay them at 0%. Um, I'm realizing that was now very silly, um, now that I'm following your program. Um, especially it's affecting my relationship with them and some of my other family members. So I'm trying to figure out what the best decision is to kind of pull out of that um, and like maybe do something like underwriting with like Churchill. I, I start talking to them about that. The concern is because I haven't had a like a payment or a mortgage for so long now that I'm not going to be able to do underwriting. So I'm trying to figure out what the best way is to get a regular mortgage again. Okay. Churchill Mortgage can help you do manual underwriting that does not require a credit score. They're right. Gonna have to, they have to establish that you pay your utilities on time, and you can prove that you pay your parents timely with simply your checking account history, can't you? Yes. Okay. That, that's the conversation we had so far. Yeah. But and you, so you can prove you paid the payments, and you prove you pay your light bill, you prove you pay your water bill, you can prove your income. I assume. What's right. your what's your income? Yes. Uh one oh five. Okay. You got a great income. How old are you? Uh twenty seven. What's the house worth? It's currently worth six hundred. And what do you owe on it? Uh two ninety six. Okay. So a fifty percent mortgage should not be a reach. Correct. It's not a big deal. Tons and tons of equity. You've got a great income. How long have you been in this job? Uh, five years. Yeah. Stable, good income. 
and you pay you can show that you paid your parents timely, right? Yes, I can. It should be a no-brainer for a, a manual underwriting. And if the person okay. you're talking to at Churchill Mortgage can't figure that out, ask to speak to their boss because Churchill Mortgage specializes in this, in manual underwriting, because we teach people to do it all the time, and we send them a lot of business because they're a sponsor for 25 years, and they'll take good care of you. Somebody there will, for sure. Um, so get on the phone with them, and they'll walk you through this. Uh, we do it all the time. I mean, it's not it's – not, this is not a problem. So what's the strain with the other family members? What are they torqued about? Uh, I have a few family members that aren't happy with you, of course, but I, I ignore those. Um, the other ones well, the, were worried I didn't, about I didn't get a mortgage with your parents. Why are they not happy with you for having a mortgage? No, no, no. Uh, unhappy with Dave Ramsey, that, but I ignore them. Oh, I thought you said your parents and your other family members weren't happy with you. It was putting a strain on your relationships. Oh, sorry. So some of my uh, – I've had other family members ask my parents for money. So I am feeling the stress of I was permitted yes and they were permitted no. Well, that's not your fault. Agreed. But they're mad at you? No, they don't know about it. That's the the bigger thing. Okay. All right. And you, is there a stress with your parents? There wasn't at first. They always give me advice. However, it feels like the advice is now more the money talking sometimes. Mm, okay. Yeah, the borrower is slave to the lender. And, um, Indeed. You know, and there's people in every family that don't like Dave Ramsey, including Dave Ramsey's family. <laughs> What? <laughs> Say it's not so. <laughs> so it's something I've come to live with, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're doing. You're doing well. You're doing well with it. It's working out for me. Yeah. If you only piss off half of America, you can still make a really good living. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and help a whole lot of people. And uh, you know what? What we end up with is. Um, you know, people that didn't want to be helped, uh, yeah. and that's that's the problem. I want to make sure people don't miss this, Dave, because we, we've taught this for a long, long time. But this is a, a family who the parents wanted to help this young man out. They did. And even though they wanted to, it still changes the dynamic. What is it about this that we – that why we create this boundary, why we preach this boundary? Well, it is a spiritual law. The borrower is slave to the lender. And the Bible doesn't say, except in cases where it's your mother and father. Right. No, it doesn't say that. Or except in cases where everyone likes every. No, it doesn't say that. It says 100% of the time that you borrow money, you take the position spiritually, mathematically, relationally of slave. Now, you might have a very kind and gentle master that is very classy. Um, when we went broke 30-plus uh, years ago... Uh, Sharon's dad loaned us some money to keep a car, and he's the kindest, most saintly man, gentle, quite the opposite of Sharon's husband. Mm. And, um, <laughs> you know, and he, he um, you know, we worked our way through, got it paid off, and he, he never one time made us feel uncomfortable by his actions or his attitudes. But I can tell you, sitting at Thanksgiving dinner felt different. Yes. Until mm -hmm. I got that cleared. That's good. Because it's in the air. You can't change it. You can't fix it. And uh, did it make me more uncomfortable than it did Sharon because it was her dad? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Of course. But it doesn't, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It's a slave-master relationship. You change it. So when you loan your friend money, they are no longer your friend. Mm -hmm. You can't keep that from happening. They're your friend as a secondary thing. Their primary relationship is now slave and master. Yeah. And it changes the dynamic. It changes the spirit in the air. You can smell it when you walk into Thanksgiving dinner. You can smell it. You can feel it. And mom and dad, in this case, are probably pretty cool people. Uh, they're just trying to help again. But now they feel the real need to help. That's right. And that, now they've gone over the help line and gone into the controlling line. Mm -hmm. And now they're starting to interfere. That's correct. And uh, they don't really have the right to do that, except that they... Or owed three hundred two hundred ninety six thousand dollars, which yep. kind of changes the it does changes your focal cords just a little bit when you say it out loud. This yep. is this is three hundred not two hundred ninety six thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're going on vacation. What? 
Right. You know, it's just like you. They may be uh, pressuring him on uh, professional moves. Yeah. You know, and and this is great maturity. That that girl you're dating spends a lot of money. That's right. You you can get real controlling. That's true. I mean, you can get all into crap when you don't have the right to, but you changed the relationship. So, you know, the old joke is if you loan your brother-in-law a hundred dollars and he never speaks to you again, was it worth it? In some cases, yes. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> you change the relationship. That's what's happening. This is the Ramsey Show. Buying a home is one of the biggest decisions of your life. You need a partner like Churchill Mortgage. Churchill is one of the highest rated lenders in the country and they're Ramsey trusted because they do what's right for you. Churchill works with you to build a mortgage the Ramsey way. One that doesn't bust your budget, sets you up for financial success and helps you get out of debt faster. Go to churchillmortgage.com today and get started. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. If you like this show, we appreciate you. We do not have a $300 million advertising budget, and we don't have a football stadium named after us like somebody, uh, or somebody like that. No, excuse me. Um, but the, uh, yeah, we're just like in here scratching and clawing and trying to help you folk, and it's what we've been doing for a long, long time. If you want to help us, uh, if you would share this show, Tell people where you're listening to it. You can share that by a link if you're on a podcast or YouTube, or you can tell people where the radio station or on TBN or wherever it is you're you're watching or listening or however. Let people know. Leave a five star review, please. Everybody that does that's very helpful. You one star people, you need to go somewhere else. Mama said if you hadn't got anything nice to say, don't say nothing at all. So there you go. No thank you. And, uh, of course, uh, you can subscribe and follow and all those appropriate things. All those things help this show move right to the front. We are now in the top 11, I think it is, podcasts in the world of any category. And that's because of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've had over a billion views on YouTube because of you folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, we recently announced that Smart Conference Weekend is going to be in Chicago, Illinois this fall, September 15th and 16th, Friday night, all day Saturday. And we hear over and over again from people that the Smart Conference is the event that lights a fire under their butts to take control of their whole lives, their relationships, their mental health, their anxiety, their money, their career, their job. It's our biggest event of the year. All the Ramsey personalities are speaking on all the different subjects of your life, and you will leave smart. That's what we do. And so with VIP tickets, you're going to have a chance to meet the Ramsey personalities, Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, George Camel, Jade Washaw, Ken Coleman, me, and you're going to get amazing seats and a cool swag with a platinum package if you're on like Baby Step 7. That includes a first-class dinner with me and all the personalities after the event is over on Saturday evening. Wow. We're going to go to a nice place. There's only 60 of those. Those will be a small dinner for just a few of us. We're going to have some fun together. We're going to laugh and answer questions and sign books and all that at that. So that's the Platinum. Uh, the VIP is very limited. Uh, the Platinum is extremely limited, like I said. Uh, the general admission tickets start at just $79. So we'd love to have you guys in Chicago in September. Ramsey Solutions dot com slash events uh did you know that you were going to dinner with some folks ken did you i knew time? that i didn't know how many but i like the uh it's always fun to meet those fine folks first time we've done that format i know we have uh breakfasts and lunches at this last smart conference here but this is going to be fun yeah be a lot of, be there cool. won't be chicken nuggets there either uh, this dave likes the good food so it's going to be it's going to be nice that way i just yeah i'm 
spoiled is what it is. So it's that. <laughs> I mean, live like no one else. Later, you live and eat like no one there, else. Oh, see, yeah. I like that. There That's go. good. Kevin's with us. Kevin is in Corpus Christi. Hey, Kevin, what's up? Not much. Thanks for taking my call, Dave. Sure, man. How can we help? Uh, I am retired. Um, I was lucky enough to leave uh, AT&T with a 401k and a retirement both. I live off the retirement and Social Security. After taxes, I net about 4500 a month, which is fine for me because everything's paid for. Uh, my house is paid for. My ranch is paid for. Everything's debt-free. Uh, I'm over 70 years old, so in about a year and a half, two years, I'm going to have to start taking uh, cuts from my 401k, uh, automatic payouts. The government makes you Yeah, your required minimum out. distribution. Yeah. Right. I don't use that money. It just sits there. It was yeah. making money under the Trump administration. It's kind of losing money right now. <laughs> yeah, notice but that. Anyway, uh, I don't really know what to do with that money because I don't need it. But I want my my gut feeling is to invest it in gold. No, uh, no, 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 no. We don't put anything in gold. No. If it, you don't that, need it and you're going to let you want to let it sit going. somewhere, let it sit in a good mutual fund. That's fine. That would do better than gold. Oh, absolutely! I I I, I own some gold cufflinks, and that's the only gold I've got. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I just don't want to do anything risky at this point. That well, money risky will is gold. Be in, it'll gold, be, gold, it gold will is be much more gold is much more volatile. If you look at the price of gold on a chart, it's way up and way down, much more than the stock market is. A lot okay. riskier. And it does not yield the, the net return. The average re annual rate of return on gold sucks. Really? Yeah, okay. it's awful. Yeah, I, so. I, I don't know that much about it. I've just heard that gold was a good, a good investment. So. Yeah, usually from people that don't have any money. <laughs> that that 401k will just be part of my daughter's inheritance. I'll That's cool. That's so. cool. You're going to pull that money out of the 401k that we're talking about because you're required to. And I would just be moving it into good, good mutual funds in in the process. Uh, I think I, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of maybe new listeners. Maybe somebody's never heard you talk about this. Why are you so emphatic about gold? And, well, th th we know why it's up and down. Why is it so up and down? Because the way it's sold is, well, if the dollar gets hurt, you need gold. I mean, that's the fear message that's behind this. Why is gold so volatile? Gold is a commodity, okay? It's a, it's a, it's a rock mm -hmm. that is yellow, mm -hmm. okay? You have barrels of oil. You have uh, precious metals, diamonds, commodities, corn, yep. commodity. And commodities are all traded 100% based on people's perception of shortage. If the perception is that there's a no shortage, that there's too much of it, the price goes down. Mm -hmm. So... Like the, the the old movie Orange Juice Futures with trading places with Eddie Murphy, which was <laughs> That's right. a mythological future. Okay, there weren't orange juice futures, but um, but it was fun for the movie's sake. But the, all that is is you're 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 betting on, and commodities are all more volatile than investments that actually create revenue. So in, investment that creates revenue is a company that's running that makes a profit. Home Depot makes a profit microsoft makes a profit and it's either a lot of profit or not much profit apple makes a profit a lot of profit and so their stock goes up based on the fact that they are creating revenue gold and corn and oil does not create revenue it only trades based on scarcity and people's perception of that scarcity is greed and fear and it's like, I'm afraid, so I'm going to rush towards it. And if a whole bunch of people rush towards it, it creates a shortage and the price goes up. But that's the only thing that causes the price to go up. The gold did not become more valuable. Just more people were chasing fewer bars. That's all it is. Supply demand drives it up. And so anytime you're investing in a commodity, you are at the mercy of the psychology of the marketplace. Everybody's scared or everybody's greedy. And they're chasing two things. Three. So that's the only way price is established, mm -hmm. where if you buy a piece of income producing real estate, price is established based on the income it creates, not based on, oh, it's real estate. Woo! 
You know, it's not, oh, it's a golden rock. Woo. Okay. So the golden rock has no magical qualities. It's a rock. It's a golden rock. Diamonds don't have magical qualities. They're a little clear thing. And they're not necessarily a girl's best friend. That is a marketing slogan by people who sell diamonds. Yes. Because diamonds do not go up in value. I've got quite a lot of them hanging around my wife. Yes. Yes. And so, well. um, and, and let me tell you how much they've gone up while I've owned them. Not. Right. At all. Right. So okay. for people that are seeing the rate of headlines. return is called marriage. Yes. But there is no <laughs> actual investment return on the stupid things. They're a complete waste of freaking money otherwise. So give us uh, 30, 40 seconds on these headlines that people are seeing. And that's why we get this call in gold. They're seeing all oh, the dollars in danger. China's making moves. Russia, it's in the headlines all the time. What should they do when they hear these headlines about the dollar and it's the danger in the dollar? Well, the number one, you can't run to gold. There's nothing magical about it. Okay. Number two, Brazil and China and Russia are large land masses. But Russia and Brazil are not large economies. Their gross domestic put output is very low. Texas has a larger gross domestic production than Brazil. Texas is a bigger economy than Brazil. So do you think that Brazil and any of their little friends are going to snipe the dollar? Not a chance. They're going to have to do business with the 800-pound gorilla. And we do business in dollars. So they're going to be at our mercy still. Y'all, there's a lot you can't control when it comes to healthcare, but there is something you should check out that can help. Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM is not insurance. It is budget-friendly, biblically-based health cost sharing. That means a community of members helping share the burden of each other's healthcare costs. They help people just like you in all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Learn more today at chministries.org slash budget. Ken Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today on the debt free stage in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions. Sean and Ashley are with us. Hey guys, how are you? <laughs> hey. Better, Better than, than we, we deserve, deserve, Dave. Welcome. Good to have you. How much uh, where you guys live? Virginia Beach. Oh cool. 757. There, there it is. is. Let's go. All right. <laughs> right there. And uh, how much debt you guys paid off? $83,892. Good for you. And how long did that take? In, uh, 28 months. Good for you. And your range of income during that two and a half years? 65000 up to one hundred and thirty. Whoa. Oh. Doubled it. Doubled it. What do y'all do for a living? Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I also do hair on the side. Mm -hmm. And I'm a construction project manager. All right. How'd you double your income in uh, two and a half years? A few promotions uh, and a good side work gig. A lot of side work. Ah, okay. Nice. All right. What was your best uh, b best money maker side gig? As a general contractor, uh, working out of town, um, just doing general contracting work uh, mm -hmm. on the side, or just various construction projects okay so like build a deck for somebody exactly. or whatever yeah mm -hmm. uh, there's good money in that yep. really good money yes. yeah good for you good for you well done Thank you. what kind of debt was the eighty four thousand? everything, everything. Uh, credit cards student loans cars you name it y'all freaking normal yeah, yeah oh yeah Very definitely. Normal. <laughs> uh, that's awful i'm yeah. sorry <laughs> i'm glad you woke up how long you've been married two um, years it, yeah yep two years yes yeah. so you started this right before you got married yeah. We canceled a wedding and we used that to pay um, some of our debt off. <laughs> COVID, <laughs> COVID did that. She's a trooper. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the COVID thing. Yeah. The okay. COVID well, thing. yeah, we're not going to get we're gonna do yeah. it now, so let's just yeah. get the debt off. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. And then we get married and keep going. Yep. All right. Good for you. Way to go. What kind of debt was the 84000 You told me it's all the different things. What was the uh, wake up call that you get connected to Ramsey? How did you find us? Well, um, our story started a little bit before um, we started 
paying our debt off. Um, in May of 2019, um, we were three weeks away from having our son, Lucas. Um, we unexpectedly lost him. Oh, no. And we found ourselves um, in a church. Um, Ascent Church is where we go. Shout mm-hmm. out to um, Thomas and Helen Lane. Um, mm-hmm. They follow your principles and they started their church um, mm-hmm. completely debt free. Wow. Um, so that is when Sean had a friend. Um, give him the Total Money Makeover book. Yep, the Craddock family, Dave Craddock, uh, went through your program, did his uh, debt-free scream years ago, mm-hmm. and um, he just gave us the Total Money Makeover, and we're off to the races from there. Listen mm-hmm. to the podcast. So your heart was broken. Absolutely. Definitely. And you, the worst possible tragedy that you can think of. Yes. And you end up in church. Yep. Mm-hmm. Praise God. Praise yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, that's a good place to heal a broken heart. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um get plugged into families to start teaching you how to do life and part of that is money yes how to do life and so read this book yes yeah and then you go gang okay Uh, while we put everything together and walk through this covid stuff and get married and all the stuff we got to do here now uh we're going to work on the money thing way to go y'all that's very cool thanks it's very cool i'm so sorry for what you went through though thank you thank you can't think of anything harder Mm. wow i'm also struck by the fact that you decided to, no, it was COVID and a lot of people were canceling weddings, but you didn't, didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice, but you, you didn't just cancel it. You, you said, we're, move, we're moving the money we from could this. Have, we could have rescheduled yeah, and we, we chose not to. And, and, and um, it how was much an, was that? How um, much money? It paid off all of the debt that I brought to our marriage. Um, so it was about $15,000. How did that feel? Did, I and mean, here's why I'm asking this. That's a big time move. And I think a lot of people wouldn't do that. Then you could excuse that. But what was your head and your heart saying to you? Were they fighting each other or were you on the same? You both were like, nope, this is God, absolutely jumpstart. God start. really was leading us to, I, I think, to this. Um, I don't really think it's worth one day. Um, the rest of our lives, we have to celebrate our marriage. It's not just all about that one specific wow. day. I Good think. for you. You got married. Yeah. You just didn't have the big That's wedding. Right. Exactly. Correct. Yes. Change That's an important yeah. thing. I think a lot of it had to do with um, our son. He was supposed to be in our wedding, and he wasn't there. So just a multitude of things led mm-hmm. to the decision. Sean also sold his truck. Yep. So we both Ooh. sacrificed <laughs> during this. Talk about that though, the jump start to that. When you do yeah. that much, not everybody can do that. Let's sure. acknowledge that. But sure. you made some pretty big moves that knock a lot of debt out quick. What does that do for your momentum? What did it do for you? It's huge. It's a, it was a huge momentum boost and it just reaffirmed that we were on the right path. It gave us the, the total momentum that we needed to just stay on the plan. And you know, Ashley came up with a great idea to build a, a debt thermometer that we were just a visual uh, mm-hmm. way that we could kind of see where we were at with the debt journey mm-hmm. and um, just seeing the massive chunks that selling the car did and, and, uh, and taking the, the, de- the, the money that we had for the wedding and put it towards the debt, it was, mm-hmm. it was huge. Contractor sells his truck, that's real. <laughs> Tell <laughs> yeah. me about it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So then- what was what the truck sell for? Oh, uh, 25000 I think. Okay, we- so that's a $25,000 move, $15,000 move, mm-hmm. and yep. boom, 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 yes. and here we go. Game on. Yep. Yes. And uh, we make decisions to live, and we're in a good church, yes. and we're walking through the, the grieving process, and we're fighting and scratching and clawing and working extra, yes. and wow. Yes. Wow. What a, what a, what a w- radical two and a half years. Very, <laughs> yes. very much so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very wild. Good for y'all. I'm proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. You're warriors. You have fought through. You yes. fought through. What do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Um, definitely the budget. I think everybody says that. Um, but also just doing it. Um, life is going to continue to happen. And um, you just have to keep going. Um, yeah. 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 And understanding that, you know, we're here to be good stewards of God's money. Mm-hmm. And when you have that mindset, the, uh, the truck you have or the vehicle you have, it's a little less important. Yeah. Yes. It's not yours, it's his. And you ask him, is, is, is this smart? Mm-hmm. Yes. And he goes, nope. And you go, oh, God, I saw a stupid truck. <laughs> yeah. So you cry a little and then you cheer when yes. it leaves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, way to go, y'all. Very, very proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We've got the uh, Live and Give box for you, the Baby Steps Millionaire's number one best selling book, because that's your next step, mm-hmm. your next uh, chapter in your story, the Total Money Makeover book. Now you'll be able to give it to some guy you run into, some gal you run into at the church that 
is needing to get started. You'll be that guy now. That's we pretty cool. We also um, have been fortunate enough that we just ended uh, leading our first financial peace class. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was well, really thank awesome. Thank you. That we thank were you. able to do that. It's an honor. Yeah, and you, yeah, it's an honor to lead it. And, boy, you really get it when you're leading it, for sure. <laughs> yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes. We've I, also got a financial peace membership in this box for you, and you'll be able to give that to somebody that's deserving now that your coordinator is in leading classes. Thank you for yes, doing that. Of course. Y'all are fun. Very, very cool. Good stuff. All right, bring the kiddos up, and let's introduce them and hear their names and ages. So this is Vivian. Mm-hmm. Vivian is six years old. Mm-hmm. Um, this is Amelia. Amelia's mm-hmm. two, and Zoe, she's five months old. Oh, yeah. boy, look at what that. What a great pick. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Very well done. All right, Sean and Ashley, Vivian, Amelia, and Zoe, Virginia Hi. Beach, 84000 paid off in 28 months, and boy, talk about a life changed. 65000 to 130 income. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream three two one we're dead free love it wow very well done it's amazing that in the middle of such heartache Mm -hmm. uh yeah and you step into spiritual transformation you step into life transformation you chip in and like she said life's gonna happen you just gotta keep going yeah I, I just think of scripture and the imagery there of beauty from ashes and out of unbelievable pain uh, of losing that little little boy, they decide to jump start by moving the money from the wedding that he couldn't be in. That's that's incredible, incredible grace um, and and transformation. It's really powerful stuff. And then to see, look at those little precious princesses up there. They have no idea what mom and daddy have done for them. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. They'll look back wow. and they'll, oh man, old lady, <laughs> back in all 23, <laughs> changed our family tree. They'll be telling their grandbabies that. This is The Ramsey Show. Thanks for joining us, America. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. The question of the day is brought to you by Neighborly, your hub for home services. Spring is here, and Neighborly can help keep your home and yard in top shape with the grounds guys, Mosquito Joe, Molly Maid, and more. So spend your time enjoying your home, not working on it. Go to neighborly.com and you can find service pros near you. April is National Financial Literacy Month. All month long, teachers and students in classrooms across America are taking time to talk about the importance of learning good money skills. So we get some questions from students this month. Today's question is from Catherine in South Carolina. She asked, my parents are paying for college. I have a paid-for car, and I have a six-month emergency fund. I want to start a Roth IRA, but I don't really understand it. What is it, and what's the best way for me to start one as a junior in high school? Well, that's Papa Dave on that one. Oh, okay. Well, you have to have an earned income to do an IRA of any kind, Uh, and so you have to have some kind of income that you pay taxes on. So you have to file a tax return showing your income and uh, you can put a maximum of six thousand uh, or or your earned income so if you make twelve hundred and forty two dollars working um, a teenager job of some kind and you file a tax return on it you can put twelve hundred forty two dollars into a Roth IRA so um, uh, 
I would not do that unless your parents are in unbelievably fabulous, wealthy financial situation. My parents are going to pay for my college can mean a lot of things. It could mean these are broke people hoping they can figure out how to do this, that they're going to borrow the money to do it, uh, that they're going to do whatever. Uh, they may mean that they've got $8 million in mutual funds. So paying for your college is not even, doesn't even break a sweat. If that's the case, then you can do a Roth IRA. But if, there, if there's any question at all, any probability at all that they're not 1,000% easily going to do this, not, not want to do it, but going to do it, can do it, have the money to do it, then you need to not do a Roth IRA and save the money for college in case the bottom falls out of your parents' world and the best of intentions leaves you. I had to take out student loans because my parents said they were going to pay it. My dad went broke in my junior year because he was so far in debt doing nothing down real estate. But, you know, could this happen? Yes, this could happen, right? This could yeah. definitely happen in this world. So I don't know where your parents' money is coming from, but you need to before you commit to not saving this money for college. I would not put money in a Roth IRA until I knew I had college covered. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to cover college if they don't, unless you're, they're just unbelievably wealthy. I would not do a Roth. But if you do do a Roth, you can do up to your earned income and up to what you do. Now, Ken, in our case, um, when our kids, Rachel included, were teenagers, we were in very, very, very good finance. We were multimillionaires, okay, in good financial shape. So we knew college was covered. We had no question about that. And all that stuff was done. I had extra money to put into something. And so every dollar that they made, I filed a tax return on each of the kids, paid the taxes. So whatever they made, babysitting, working at Ramsey, selling books off the back table at a seminar, which they did do, uh, whatever that, wherever they work, working at the mall, I added it all up as much as I could honestly say uh, that they made, filed a tax return on that, and then put that much in their Roth IRA. And $1,230 was one of them one year. That's why I remember that number. Um, and one of them was $5,000 one year. And one of them was, I don't think any of them maxed it out ever. I don't think any of them made, maybe right. you know, Rachel might've made $6,000 one year cause she could go make money. She, she was the, a money maker, but, uh, you know, so we maxed them out or didn't max them out, but we put a couple thousand, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,230, whatever it is. And then, and then it just sat there, didn't add anything to it in college. Cause they didn't really pay. I didn't do tax returns when they were in college. They come out of college though. They had a lot of money already in Roth sure. IRAs. That's fantastic. I mean, it wasn't hundreds of thousands, but there was a good, real good start for the hand on that account. When they got married and came out of college and took off, they had a real good leg up. So you can do that if you're up at baby step seven and you've got all kinds of room. Yes. But should a teenager fund their own Roth IRA? Almost never. A teenager should uh, fund their college before they fund their Roth IRA. It's a education. As bad as we all are mad about it being overpriced, as bad as we are mad at people taking degree, getting degrees and stupid butt stuff that they shouldn't, go get a good degree from a good college. Don't overpay for it, and in, in something that's actually usable in the marketplace. Don't get a degree in German polka history. Okay, there's only one thing you can do with that. Get a PhD and teach other people people German polka history. There is no outlook for that. So, you know, if you're not doing that and you're going to invest money and go to a state school and spend 30, 40, 50,000 bucks in, in tuition and go through and get a four year degree in something that's usable, you'll get a better rate of return on that 30 or 40,000, 50,000 dollars than you will put in that same money into a mutual fund. Education's still worth it. When done right. When done right. That's right. Yeah. And where it applies to something that you want to do with your life. Yeah. You know, the, the question that we put before parents and, and students is, is it the only way? Is it the best way? Is it the only way to get qualified to do what I want? Or is it the best way? And if the answer is no to either one of those, there are other ways. And let's be clear, that's still education. Just because it's not a four-year yeah. school, yeah, you're I, still you going to have to go get to educated. code school, go to tech school. That's right. You can do so, whatever. I mean, I don't care what you're doing. But listen, if you stop learning after high school, yeah, you're going to struggle with your income the rest of your life. That is correct. No matter what you do, yep. and if you stop learning after college, 
I, I read three books in the last month that were nonfiction. I mean, you have you cannot stop yeah. learning. You have to read something, you know, turn off Tiger King and go be a better person. <laughs> right. That's oh, my so gosh. True. Right. And so take a class, go to a conference, uh, you know, watch a live stream, do something that you learn yeah. something today. Here's that, one. Sit down with a successful person that's 20, 30 years older than you and interview them. Like, like it was a book report on their life. Sit down with people who are way ahead of you. Pedro's in Hartford, Connecticut. Hey, Pedro, how are you? How you doing, Ramsey? Better than we deserve. What's up? Yeah, I'm dealing with a little strange situation. And I just wanted to get like a second opinion to see how I should um, tackle this. Okay. So to get yeah to get straight into the question, so the, uh, our landlord is currently want to charge us for an electric bill that never got fixed. And I believe the price is like around two thousand and five hundred. I'm sorry, the electric bill. The, the, yes. That, so the, the cost of electricity into the apartment. Yeah. So here's what happened. So we were able. Um, so the previous landlord um, gave us the green light to use uh, one of our dryers that we purchased, and we install it in the basement. Now he told us that this is like an electrical problem. That the the Somebody else is getting billed under that electricity that we use it for the dryer, but he told us that he's going to fix that. Um, fast forward four years later, um, we have a new landlord now, but she told us that the, um, the currency never got fixed, the electric currency never got fixed, and that you know we we messed up and not telling her that we were using the um, her. Um, the electricity to dry our clothes under her on, under her bill, and she, so she blamed us basically. But um, you know, we had a conversation um, the day before yesterday, and I told her like, listen, like we didn't know that the, the currency never got fixed. You know, our previous landlord told us that it was okay for us to wash the clothes that he was going to handle it, but apparently he never handled that situation. Yeah. Is there anything so, written in the lease about this in any way? Not any written down. So I do have this contact information, and then um, the you do, only you thing do that we have, have is that you do have what? No, that we 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 have this contact information. The previous landlord. Contact no, 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 no. I'm not have. talking about that. I said, is is there anything in a in the written lease about this at all? No, there's okay. not anything in the written lease. Tell, no. tell your landlord, um, you you have moved out, right? We're going to move out, but yeah. she um. No, I'm not paying twenty five hundred dollars. It's not on you. And this is a verbal disagreement, and she's going to have a heck of a time collecting it. Um, it's, it's on her. She's owned a house and didn't know where the dadgum current was going. That's on her, um, not on you. So it's on both of you for doing a stupid butt deal, but uh, not getting things written down and fixed and watch how business is done, but it's going to be a hassle. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. From the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He's the host of the Ramsey Network, Ken Coleman Show, where he talks to folks about their job about their career, about how to make more money every day, how to get out of a toxic work environment every day. And we're here to help you today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Thanks for joining us. Ashley's going to start this hour off in Salem, Oregon. Hi, Ashley. How are you? Hi, Dave. I'm doing good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? So my husband and I own a plumbing business, and um, it is a debt-free business. And at this point, we are trying to decide when our business is ready to uh, bring on an apprentice or hire a journeyman uh, to help move our business forward. And what kind of business did you say it is? A plumbing. Plumbing. 
Okay, so you're mm-hmm. going to hire uh, someone into the junior position and uh, work them up, work their skill level up by uh, starting as an attorneyman or apprentice. Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, an apprentice is about a four-year program here in Oregon, mm-hmm. and then a journeyman, journeyman would be someone who has completed the program. Mm-hmm. And so how quickly do they actually decide. start producing work? Mm-hmm. In about two years is when you're no, able to work no, 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 no. You're going to put them to work day one. Ooh, yes, yes. How quickly before years, they actually they do go. some work that has value to your company, regardless of their status as licensed or journeyman or apprentice or whatever? They're going to start putting pipes uh, in right now. Right, yes. So I, I would say, depending on how well they receive the information, you know, within 90 days, we're going to know if we're going to be probably ready to put them into the apprenticeship program um, based on their performances. Okay. So I guess what I'm looking for is any time that a business is hiring someone, uh, we have to make more on the work that they do than they cost us. If we mm-hmm. don't, we go out of business. Mm-hmm. And so when you hire someone for $18 an hour, they have to produce something that creates more than $18 an hour for you in savings Mm -hmm. or in revenue produced or something. Something has to happen Mm -hmm. that that makes you worth that. And um, as as soon as they start self-sustaining, meaning they're producing more savings or revenue than they cost – um, then, then you're, it's no longer a problem. It's now, a, it's now a blessing mathematically to the mm-hmm. business. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. And I watched within the apprenticeship program as my husband did it. And as he trained others that were in the company he was at, you know, in, in that two years when they start sending them off to do jobs and then the journeyman's come in and are checking their work. So they're actual revenue is definitely increased. Yeah, but um, if your husband so, can do twice as much work cuz he's got a sidekick, yes. Mhm. You're making money on the kid day 1. Okay. Are you turning away work right now because your husband can't get to it? We are turning away a little bit of work. Um, you know, you're coming out of the the winter season so mm-hmm. it slows down during that time and then heading towards summers and we're going to start picking up even more. Um, so we, if you can we, do we more work with the bit. kid than without the kid, he's starting to pay for himself. That's right. Okay. That's what and I'm talking about. This is I not mean, about apprenticeship. This is not about journeyman. This is not about licensing. This is not about that. It's do they create more production than they cost? And at that point, they're free. Okay. But until then, they're a cost. Does that make sense? Right. So yeah. if your husband, because he's got a sidekick, can bring in an extra sixty thousand dollars a year, and you're paying the kid forty, you're making money day, as soon as you start that process, mm-hmm. regardless of his title. Mm-hmm. Is that logical? That does, that do, yes, that does make sense. And some of our foundation in that is like, do we need to have X amount saved up before we hire this person as well? Um, so you need to we, have enough to, until they start making you more than they cost you. So if it's going to be 90 days before they add any value, then you need 90 days worth of their income set aside as extra retained earnings. Okay. If it's going to awesome. be if it's going to be six months before they're valuable, then you need six months of mm-hmm. their income set aside because they're basically okay. a cash drain until they're not. Mm-hmm. And that, that's right. what you're figuring out. How much of a cash drain are they before they become a cash blessing? Hey, let me ask you this, Ashley. How hard a time are y'all having finding these people? Um, so when we first started discussing it, we had had like two high schoolers that were interested because my husband had talked to um, some young, young adults, which he'd like to be able to train kids kind of coming out of high school, early 20s. Good. Um, and so we... That it's an area that he is passionate about getting into and working with. Um, so I don't think it'll be terribly hard to find, um, but it could take a little bit to find the right um, click because, yeah. you know, not everyone wants to be out digging a ditch in the rain. Yeah. In Oregon. yeah, it's like hard work and stuff. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me give you a little bit of advice really quick on that for your husband. Um, that's true, but you got to find the kids that do want to be working with their hands, having a lot of autonomy, and serving by fixing. And if you can show them what that path looks like in one year, two years, three years, and say, look, if you come in and do that hard work now, I'm telling you, it's going to pay off big time. You've got to sell that. 
And that's on him. That's on you all to get that kid who wants to do the type of work but hasn't been taught how to do hard work by their parents. Let me tell you who's never unemployed. A plumber. That's a fact. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? (laughs) We are always going to need a plumber. That's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah. Always. So, I mean, there's, I mean, car detailer. You might not need. You probably can do that. But yeah. you, you're going to be a plumber. You're going. That's tra- right. The trades are always going to pay off. Hey, Micro is coming to town with me next week, and we are going to do with Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney, Nicholas Eberstadt, and uh, uh, Pastor Craig Groeschel, and uh, Michael Easter, who wrote the book Comfort Crisis. Uh, we're all doing an event here at the Ramsey Event Center called America's Labor Crisis. Hiring in this current environment is crazy. The live stream is free. You can watch this. If you're running a small business, we're going to talk about hiring in this environment. We're going to talk about the labor crisis. We're going to talk about the 7.2 million males, 2554, that are not even looking for work. They're sitting in their mother's basement. And in a great turn of irony, playing Call of Duty. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, we're going to talk about all this, and we're going to talk about how you business folks, like in Ashley's situation, what you could do. Like Ken just gave her some good insight, what you're looking for, and how to hire in this environment. And at Ramsey Solutions, we're hiring right now. Uh, Other people are firing. We're still hiring. And in 30 years, we've never laid off a soul for financial reasons. We fired people that misbehaved. For our people that didn't weren't any good at their business, but but we've never laid somebody off because we had a, a financial strain, and we're hiring. And believe me, we're way more than just a radio show around this place. There's almost 1,100 of us in this building. So check out the open roles here at RamseySolutions.com slash careers. And uh, you, you programmers out there, we don't work 80 hours. We go home at 530. And we don't ask you. Oh, and we don't work from home. We work for work. We work from work. We have a building. We all come together. We like each other. Yeah. RamseySolutions.com slash careers. This is The Ramsey Show. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today again next Thursday evening May the 4th may the 4th be with you right yes be easy to remember uh Mike Rowe and I will be hosting five top thought leaders including Mr. Ken Coleman on the subject of work careers work ethic education crisis uh there's a labor crisis in America we have uh, 4 million people quitting a month still, and we have seven. Uh, we have about 5 million jobs in deficit right now, mm-hmm. that, that are more jobs than workers, and we have 7.2 million males, I won't call them men, that are 25 to 54 years old that are sitting at home not even looking for work. They're not even in the unemployment statistics. We don't know what they're doing, except when you survey them, according to Nicholas Eberstadt, one of the people that will be on with us on uh, next Thursday night, uh, they are spending somewhere from five to seven hours a day on screens, which means they're either watching pornography or they are playing Call of Duty. So I don't know what they're doing, but apparently not producing anything. Yeah. So except trouble for all of us. So there you go. And CBS News coming out with, when it comes to quiet quitters, highly paid men lead the exodus. Ken, you've been talking about this a lot on your show, The Ken Coleman Show. Yeah, so we've got college-educated men who are making good money who are doing this quiet quitting, this phenomenon that just basically says, I'm only going to do the bare minimum. I'm not going to go above and beyond. I'm not going to plug into a team. I'm only going to do what is expected of me. show up. And show up. And it's really troubling. Collect a paycheck. Yeah, and so what's happening is is you've got men, and this, this speaks to a lot about what we talk about here when you hear us use phrases like work that matters. Every human being, Dave, longs to make a contribution. And when you have a job where you feel like 
eh, I'm not really driven towards a goal. I don't have a missional, purposeful connection to the work or to the organization. Then this is what happens. And you've got a lot of skillful men who are basically stealing from organizations. They are just getting by. They're making it through to Friday afternoon to happy hour and drinking their face off because there's no meaning, there's no drive. And so that's one part of this male problem. The other part is what you just were touching on is the seven plus million men that are not working, they're 25 to 54, they're working able, okay? That means they can work, but they're not. And the reason is because they've left the workforce because of status. The data from these economists are showing us these men are not making the money or they don't have the professional status. So think of a title or a job that maybe they desired and the money with it. And so instead of getting back up on the horse and getting after it, they've literally taken their toys and they've gone home. I remember when I was a kid, we played with a bunch of guys in the neighborhood. And you, know, you don't have like, maybe you're playing cops and robbers or cowboys and whatever. And you've got this whole thing played out. And then somebody gets mad. And they go home and it ruins the game. And that's exactly what is happening. It is a childish response. I'm not getting what I expected out of life. And so I'm going to go home. And here's the worst part. That's right. And family members and friends are supporting these men. And the government. And the government. That's right. But they can't completely, you know, uh, live this way if we've got family members and friends who say, you know what, it's time for you to grow up. I understand you got your feelings hurt. I understand that you were done wrong in some cases, but you need to go be productive. And so that's the crisis we're dealing with where we have more jobs available than people who are actually looking for work. You know, and there's a sadness that goes with this. Yeah. Um, You get a little bit disgusted with these people in a sense when you start talking about them. But then when you really dig into who they are, number one, a whole bunch of those folks – Fauci told them they weren't essential. That's correct. And the rest of the culture stood up and said, you're not essential. How would you like to be told you're not essential? That's right. Makes me excited about going back. Yeah. And um, I was actually having a discussion with one of the top politicians in the middle of all of that here in Tennessee, a discussion. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And um, uh, telling him that we were opening back up here at Ramsey before they were comfortable with us doing that. Because the data that we had said that we were perfectly safe, and turns out we were right. Um, so we opened up, and everybody, Dave Ramsey's trying to kill his employees. You remember all that, right? Oh, yeah. And so, uh, which is kind of oxymoronic. If I kill off all my employees, I'm not going to get the work done. That's kind of dumb. I spent a lot of money getting these employees. I'm not going to kill them all. Um, maybe one or two, but no, I'm kidding. No, I mean, <laughs> we didn't kill anybody. Everybody Uh-oh. lived. It's okay. So, uh, you know, and he said, he said, well, I thought y'all could, I thought y'all were still at work. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I just assumed y'all were essential. And I said, well, how do you know if you're essential? And he's, he, this is a top. Oh, yeah. A local leader. Yeah. The, the top. Yeah. And, and how do you know you're essential? And he goes, I'm not sure. I think you just decide you are. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because, <laughs> I mean, nobody ever really got the definition of essential, but we did tell an entire generation of waiters and waitresses to go home because you're not essential. Mm-hmm. We told an entire generation of hotel maids to go home, you're not essential. Mm -hmm. We told people that cut hair to go home, you're not essential. And boy, did some of you get to looking ragged after that. Um, Because apparently they were essential, but not essential to me, but for people like you. I remember you You, were like, get a haircut, Coleman. You you needed a haircut. You started calling me helmet head. It was was, hurt my feelings, folks. You did look like a helmet head. It was a COVID head. You know something, Dave? There's something else, too. For decades, and Mike Rowe is going to be co-hosting with Dave. Dave and Mike are good friends. I've had the opportunity to interview Mike multiple times for our events here. And Mike told us a story years ago of being in his high school with his guidance counselor. And above his guidance counselor's head on the wall was a poster that was very popular. And it essentially showed split screen, if you will, on one side is a college grad with a diploma and a dentine ting smile, and he was happy. And on the other side was a guy in overalls with a wrench that could kill a Clydesdale, and he's got, you know, dirt and grease all over him, and he's sad. And that was the message that was marketed to us. And so to add to what Dave is saying- Working people aren't happy. Well, you're a loser if, if you're, you don't if you're have in the a degree. Trade. You're, if you're in the trades. That's correct. And, and nowadays, a diesel mechanic and a bulldozer operator make more than some of you lawyers. That's fact. But let's think about these five, these seven million men 
who've taken their ball and they've gone home because we don't want to just attack them because it is said. But here's what they've heard. For decades, we have told people that if you can't get a degree, you're less than. Yeah. And so this has played into the psychology that they wake up yeah. one and day. And so now I, I can't do any jobs that are that I'm proud of so that I'm my just, mommy can brag about yes. when she's at this whatever at the nail right. salon. What's your son do? I can't tell you. I'm ashamed of it. And my son's a doctor. Exactly. He's eight hundred million dollars in debt, yeah. and he can't breathe, and he hates being a doctor. But he's a doctor. Yeah. And my son's a garbage man. And he's worth right. eight million dollar net worth. <laughs> right. But see, society has told these men By that the way, they're losers. High probability. If you collect garbage, you're going to be a multimillionaire. Right. It's a big money making machine. They're about as they're about as necessary as plumbers. That's right. So, but, but see, Dave, we've told these men they're losers, and now they believe it. And women. In these same things, it's not a. That's correct. Just That's right, and and so the, the data the, on this per, that Eberstadt has, we'll be talking about on Thursday night. By the way, you guys sign up for that free live stream. You go to RamseySolutions dot com. You can watch this. It's going to be about a two hour presentation. It's some pretty heady yes, stuff. Yes. There, there's a lot of psychology involved. There's a lot of uh, economics involved. Uh, there's some moral ethical questions that are involved. And uh, Mike Rowe and I are not afraid to attack those. I'm a little more rough and tumble than he is. Mike's a little more sophisticated in how he approaches these things and a little more gentle with the touch <laughs> yes he's got the smooth and, uh, velvety me voice. i'm gonna throw a spear through your face i mean it's just <laughs> we're gonna fix this crap wow. so i mean it, this is just has to happen it's <laughs> unbelievable i can't stand it it makes me so yeah it's, it's not just a boomer thing because here's the thing of the seven guys seven main guys sitting at home it's they're not doing well no. Their suicide rate is through the roof. Yes, anxiety, depression. Their anxiety numbers uh, and yeah. medicated. The number of Absolutely. them that are medicated is through the roof. Their uh, the depression numbers. Oh, the despair statistics on these guys is absolutely horrible. We have done them no favors by teaching them that it's okay not to work. There is great dignity in work. There is great agency in work. Getting a callus is a sign of respecting yourself. Whether the callus is on your brain because you faced some stress and had perseverance and grit and walked through it, or whether the callus is on your hand because you run a bulldozer all day and you actually caused crap to happen. There is great dignity in work, and we got to get back to that. We're going to talk about that Thursday night at length. Don't miss it. Go to RamseySolutions.com. Watch the free live stream. Ken Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today, reminding you America's labor crisis with Mike Rowe, Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney, and other thought leaders and experts on America's labor situation right now. A, li a free live stream next Thursday night, May the 4th. We want you to join us. It is a free thing. You can just but sign up for it. you got to go to RamseySolutions.com, and we'll send you the link and get you all set up. There will be about a 1,000 folks here on site at the Ramsey Event Center with Mike and I, and um, we're going to be talking about this. It's going to be a, a healthy conversation. Mike and I have enjoyed discussing this offline uh, mm. too much because we're <laughs> both a little bit into this idea that work ethic matters, that the trades matter, that um, people are essential. And that they are their best versions of themselves when they are actually working. Thomas is with us in Greenville, South Carolina. Hey, Thomas, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Certainly. How can I help? So I work at a small manufacturing company. We got about forty-five employees total. I've got a team of seven, and um, I'd love some insight on how to help my team see just the bigger picture of. We're all in the company trying to get a single goal, not our department versus their department. Um, and want to pitch in when we've got a slow period, let's go help another department instead of having the, you know, not my job syndrome. I'm not going over there. 
Wow. What is the uh, singular vision? Can you describe it, how you would tell those seven folks if I was sitting there watching you talk about it? In a nutshell, it's uh, ship units, ship breakers. Um, that's that's what we're trying to do. Is we're we're a startup. We've had about three years going, and and we're still trying to just get in a rhythm of we need to get product out the door that's quality, that's on time, that meets customer spec, and that's our goal. How many times has this happened? This question you described, where a couple, or is it the whole team of seven that are griping about pitching in and helping another team? Fairly unified. I've got one guy who's pretty consistently uh, just quietly like, all right, I'm going to go over here and do what I can. But uh, most everybody is very comfortable with um, this is my job. And they're doing a great job with their job, Um, just not wanting to step outside of that wheelhouse. Right. But I mean, is the one guy or all seven don't want to help the other team when it's slow and we need to pitch in? Is it all seven or just the one guy? No, no, one guy's doing a great job of helping. The other six. Oh, are, the other six. Like, no, I'm, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm staying in my world. Well, the welcome to leadership. Um, what you got to figure out is what's driving that bad attitude. Uh, this is an attitude. Um, yep. It happens here at Ramsey Solutions all the time where we all say, hey, we're going to jump in and help. And, and, and it's, it's about the big picture mission. If this helps them, it helps Ramsey. If it helps Ramsey... It helps me. It's it's we're a part of a much bigger picture, and and so when someone's not bought into that, it is an attitude, and you have to figure out where is the attitude coming from. Is it selfishness, or is it that they don't feel valued, they don't feel like they're bought into the big picture? And I think that's where you got to start, Dave, to dive into that a little do you, bit. Do you have control over hiring and firing them? Uh, yeah. So you could hire new people into the position. I could, yeah. Okay. All right. Because you're probably going to fire at least one. Because mm-hmm. you, you got somebody behind the scenes that's running an undercurrent on you and setting the tone faster. That they're, they're shoveling the poop in faster than you can shovel it out. And you don't know who that is yet because right now you got a blanket six. You got one good yep. guy, six bad ones. All six of them aren't bad. Five of them are followers. One of them's the dog. And he's probably going to get fired when you figure out who he is. It's gotcha. probably the only way you're going to get this cleaned up because this is a disease that's contagious. It didn't just land in there randomly. It has spread this attitude. Yeah. And so, by the way, winning is also contagious. By the way, enthusiastic response to the outcome of the whole organization is, is contagious too. Cult, it's culture you're building inside the organization. And so the way we talk about it around here is we often say we – this is what we do. Mm-hmm. We, okay. as a team, guys, we as a team, when there's a need over there, we're going to enthusiastically help. If you want to be a we, you're going to enthusiastically help because that's what we do. You may not want to be a we. You may opt out. And if you don't, that you just let me know and we'll work that out. I'll help you get your severance package together. But we are going to do this and because when we help the whole place the whole place makes more money and when the whole place makes more money we all have opportunity to be promoted we all have opportunity to make more money because the place is making more money when the place is barely struggling to get the dadgum product out the door because we're standing over here with our fingers in our ear, then we are harming ourselves because we're shaking up the stability of the whole place. You know, this money that gets paid in payroll doesn't come from freaking Santa Claus. It comes from the customers saying you did a good job. Profit is the applause your customers give you. And so when we need to get something done around here, it is for in our own personal selfish best interest to make this place run as good as it can run because that gives us the most upside. We get nothing but downside by sitting on our butts. So we are going to be fired up and wired up, and we are going to take the hill. We're going to push the ball over the line and score the freaking touchdown. That's what we are going to do. Now, it's up to you whether you want to be a we or not. I can't make you be a we. And, uh, Thomas, a lot of times when I'm doing a leadership conference, people will ask me uh, how I motivate people. I don't motivate people. I hire motivated people, and I fire demotivated people. 
And when I get enough okay. motivated people in the room, the whole room will freaking explode with electricity. And I can't make that happen, but I can make the environment happen because you cannot win the Kentucky Derby with a donkey. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Do you yeah. know who the dog so how- is? You know who the problem child is? Not not offhand. Cause, okay. Because like I said, they're they're all they're they're great at their job. Yeah. When you take um, each one of them off for coffee to the side and you have this wee discussion, watch the body language and yeah. watch the eyes. Yeah. Okay. I'll that tell was you, my next question. Watch, so how do I do, do I hear a, do I hear a sigh? <sighs> yeah. I'll tell you another technique. I'm being lectured again. Oh no, this will be okay. the last one because you ain't gonna be here. Yeah. So, Thomas, okay. there's another way to do this, too. I agree. You need to do the one-on-one, but I'll tell you the quickest way to figure it out is put them all in the room together, all seven guys, and say, hey, when we've had to jump in before, I've noticed that we don't have the best attitude, and I want to know your all thoughts. What are, what are your stressors? What, why do you – do you see this? Just ask some open-ended questions about what you see and get their feelings and watch who they look at. But I don't, I don't think, I don't think your snake will say a thing. No, when but the, the others not will a, look at group thing. they'll look at the snake though. Watch, they'll look at him. Yeah, they'll give a side eye. You, it you, might, you might it happen. Out. Yeah, good. I'm just saying that's one option. But Dave, can I throw another scenario out here sure. real quick to Thomas? Sure. This is also a part of leadership. It's why we do what we do at Entree Leadership. And I, the fact mm-hmm. that you said that all seven of these guys are good workers, they're just not. Six of them don't have a good attitude about being team players. There is a difference. You can be a good worker, but not a good team player. And I just wonder if they are good workers, it implies to me that they have good character. So maybe you come alongside of them and say, this is a way to grow in your life. And and here's why we do this. This, The the, the talk that Dave just gave, that whole we talk, I think you're going to have to train some of them. If they've got good character and they work hard, it is plausible that they could be a good team player. But you're going to have to cast vision and show them specifically like Dave was laying out. I'd rework that exactly how Dave said it. I'd say it that way because I think – Good workers, Dave, yeah. imply good character. And some of these young men haven't been taught how to to be a well, team you player. Get, you get socialized by the people you hang out with. Boom. And if you're hanging out with people who say, well, the little man can't get ahead. <laughs> Thank God it's Friday. It's true. Oh, God, it's Monday. If that's who you hang out with, you're going to sound just like them in a month. So you need some new friends. Really. If Eeyore is their spirit animal, they gotta go. We gotta move on to something else. Oh, it's bad. It's just awful. I don't know how we're gonna make it. Jeez, come on. This is the Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Psalm 128, 2. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. James Jordan, the father of Michael Jordan, said, If you work hard, you will get the things you want. Pretty simple. Yeah. Can't simple. disagree with that one. Can't disagree with the results from his son either. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He wrote the book From Paycheck to Purpose. He is one of America's leading experts on careers, on jobs, on finding purpose in your work. And we are talking about all of that today. The phone number, 888 Steve is with us in St. Louis. Hi, Steve. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, thank you, guys. How are you? Better than we deserve, sir. What's up? So I've got a question about a labor crisis. That's what you guys are talking about. And boy, I can feel it. Uh, labor crisis is affecting me, too. I own an accounting firm, and we did an acquisition of another accounting firm uh, maybe uh, about a year ago. And with that acquisition, brought over a couple employees. These employees are really good workers. Uh, they do great work. The clients like them a lot. 
Um, but uh, they don't fit with the long-term vision of the company. Uh, they, they don't fit culturally. They've actually undermined me with some uh, processes, uh, even to some clients in a couple of situations. But with the, the labor shortage, um, I'm having a hard time uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do here. They're not good long-term, but they're great short-term. What, and I'm afraid what, why are they the not a culture fit? Why can they not adapt to your culture? You bought their company. Yeah, we bought their company, and they were a great accounting firm for 30 years, and they did not change their processes one bit in 30 years. I know. Why can these people not adapt and fit into your place? Why why is it impossible for them to do that? I don't think they want to. I think they like the way they used to do it better. Yeah, but I don't think they understand that it's getting ready to cost them their job. I don't know if they understand that either. I don't either. And that's a leadership thing. That's on you. Okay. What they don't like is change. Based on how yep. you described and understand. Well, they're accountants. Yeah, right. But most humans don't <laughs> like change. But I mean, but you got to understand that. It's not that they don't want to. It's that they're scared to death of the change. Now, as Dave said, if you lay it out for them and go, you have to change. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to show you how to change. And then they buck up. Well, then they don't want to. But you don't know that they don't want to change. We do know that change is scary for everybody and certainly for accountants. So here's how it would sound if it was at my place. Okay. We'd sit down in private, not in front of anybody else, very calmly and quietly, no raised voices, no swearing, no nothing like that. And we just say, listen, when we brought you guys in, I, as your leader, made a mistake and I need to apologize for that. The mistake I made was I did not communicate to you how important it is that you're loyal to this team and to me, how important it is that you fit in with the culture. Even if you do a good job, you're going to have to do those things in order to stay. And I sure hope we can work this out because you really do good work. And Mm -hmm. I didn't do a good job on the front end of telling you that doing good work is not the only thing you have to do to be here. And I'm making up for that today because I want to be very clear with you doing good work is not enough to let you stay here. We're also going to have to be loyal to me. If you have a disagreement with me, you never undermine me with a customer again, or that'll be your last day because we don't do that here. If you have a disagreement with me, that's fine. I could be wrong and you're welcome to disagree with me, but you're going to do it with me in private, not in front of a customer. That's embarrassing for you, for me and for the customer. And we don't do that period. That's a real breach of ethics. Now, number two, we as accountants are not a people who like change, but Mm -hmm. change is coming and we have to embrace some of it. We have to add new technologies. We have to embrace some of it in order to stay up with the times. Otherwise, we will be bought by another firm. That's what happened to your old firm. And it's not going to happen to us because we're going to make the adaptations and change as part of it. And we're all going to go through the pain of that. It's painful for me too. I don't like change either. I'm a freaking accountant, but I know I have to do this and you do too. So embracing the change, embracing the new processes and being loyal are part of doing a good job here. Simply doing the task is not enough for you to remain with us. You may want to opt out based on this conversation, And if you do, I understand. But you need to understand real clearly how we're going to go forward, you and me. And that's very kind. Nothing mean about that, is it? No, not at all. I'm finding a hard time. uh, I think it'd be hard for me to find good replacements for them. And so I feel like I've got to put up with them longer than I would like to. I'm not putting up with the crap you're talking about for 30 seconds. Yep. Yeah. If you you want to write a whole series of emails trashing the leadership of Ramsey, and think you're going to be working here tomorrow, you're confused. No way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to run me down with a customer, I'm going to talk to you one time about that and say, you know, I listen, I make a mistake every day. You can talk to me about my mistakes. You can talk to me about you wouldn't have done it that way, but we're going to do that together in private. We're never doing that in front of a customer. You are not going to create problems for the customer and stay here. I mean, so very short term, it feels like it'd be hard to service the clients without. It, you, you, yeah, you'll be all right. Places. You'll be all right. You're going to have a bigger yeah. problem cleaning up the mess with your clients if these goobers are running you down to your clients. Yep, yep. yep. You're digging a bigger hole every day they do that than you're going to dig by them not being there. I'm amazed at how fast 
how unimportant we all are. And you realize that after you're gone for two weeks and nobody notices. <laughs> yeah. And we're all that way. Yeah. I mean, if I went off the air tomorrow, it'd be about three people cry and two of them would be in my family. And the rest of you would be going, well, what else are we going to watch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'd miss you, Dave. I'd miss you a lot. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I got four. I got four people. But yeah. There you go. Yeah, four. Ken? Yeah, Steve, you're also assuming here, Dave gave you terrific advice, and you're assuming yep. that they're going to go, well, nope, Steve, I'm not going to make these slight systemic changes. I'm out. You're assuming that they're going to gamble. And you feel like the gamble's on you by confronting them in a very professional way that Dave laid out. And I, I, I don't think you should assume that. Um, and, and so it's, I could still hear the fear, and I understand where that's coming from. I don't say that from a place of judgment. I'm trying to set you free from it to say, look, uh, if you make it very clear to them that they've got to stop doing this, uh, this 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 undermining because it, they're resisting change and they must accept the change is exactly what they must accept, or we're going to have to agree – to part ways. You got to lay that with them, my friend, because if you stay in a place where you're afraid of it, they will smell that on you and it will turn toxic. People like that, if it's truly something where they are just kind of a nasty spirit and they sense fear on you, they will take an inch and an inch and an inch and an inch and an inch. And one day you'll just be done with it and you've had it. And we're trying to save you from that. Uh, let me just tell you, I am amazed that when you kindly and gently and very clearly tell folks what's going on, that almost all the time mm. they get right on board. Yep. Very seldom do you have somebody that bows up and says, well, that's it. I'm out of here. Yep. I agree I mean, with that. Unless they already were out of here and that conversation just finished it, mm -hmm. you know, but if they're, if they're 50, 50, what I'm talking about will turn them and they'll get right yep. on board. I agree. Cause I don't think these are bad people. I think they've just been allowed no. to get away with this crap. Yep. I think they've placated me before by saying, yeah, I can make that change, but then they don't make the yeah, change. Yeah, yeah, and we don't discuss, we don't talk about what you say you're going to do. We talk about what you do. Yeah. And doing things is what we're going to, is, is what's going to be required. And so, yeah. I don't, you know, if I tell my wife I'm going to send her flowers, it don't count. <laughs> right. It only counts if I do it. Right. You know, my intent doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the actual action. And my guess matters. is in this case that their fear of losing their job is greater than the fear of change. And then he walks alongside him and said, listen, I know this is painful. I'm going to serve you well. I'm going to help you with it. We're going to help you yeah. get through this change. It's yeah. not going to be as bad as you think. Yeah. And, and we can do this together if you want to do it. That's But correct. I can't make you do it. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I can make you do is not be here. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. I think you're valuable. I want you to be on the team and, you know. And I goofed up by not letting you know this on the very first day. I should have told you this on the first day. Sorry about that, but now we're going to fix it. So here we go. Game on. <laughs> that puts us out of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's Ken. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started.